Hey, hey, it's Tuesday. And once again, it's the first Tuesday of the month. So here is another episode of True Crime and Chill. Supernatural style. Last month would have normally been Arizona's episode, but when I started digging into La Llorona, I realized her story was much bigger than the state of Arizona, and she needed her own episode. Yeah, so when I, okay, so not gonna lie, Arizona, for how big you are, you really, you're lacking, you're lacking on the urban legends, like... (laughs) I really, so, because, like, we agreed to do it and everything, and I was going to write the episode, and then life got in the way, and that's when you were like, hey, you know what, take a step back, I got this. So I was like, okay, cool. But, like, when I went in searching, I was like, okay, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to get this. I spent four days searching, and, like, it kept coming back with, like, episodes that, like, we probably could have put, like, three or four of these urban legends into an episode and just called it an episode, because these urban legends were so small there really wasn't a lot of information to them. The only one that kept popping up regularly was La Llorona. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? Let's do it. We have a Conjuring Universe movie out about it. People are going to be interested in it. Like, I'm seeing a lot of it in Arizona. Let's do it. And then Amber messaged me. He's like, hey, so this is not just, like, for Arizona. Like, it's everywhere. I was like, yeah, no, it's totally, like, a, a huge part of the Mexican culture. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so I was like, I was like, okay, whatever, let's do this and everything. Right. But like, I was like, Arizona, I'm saying this with love. Y'all got to start getting some more like urban legends out there because you're slacking. <laughs> well, fortunately, my advisor for school lives in Arizona. And so when I had one of my meetings with her, I talked to her on the phone and she was like, oh, you should look into Jerome, Arizona. And I was like, Really? So, this month, with Alex back, we're going to get back on track with our State Urban Legend series, focusing on Arizona, specifically the ghost town of Jerome, Arizona. Woohoo! Let's go. Yeah. Except, we might want a disclaimer first, Ugh. because, I, like I said, I found we get yelled at less when we have a disclaimer. <laughs> all right, all right. Yes, I am salty. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Well, you want to start us off there? Okay, so we, y'all, look, I'm going to be real honest with you. We're not paranormal investigators or demonologists, okay? That would be, that would freaking rock, okay? But we're just fans who have had experiences and opinions of our own. Yeah, to say the least. (laughs) So we do our best to research the real stories behind the paranormal experiences and the urban legends, but we cannot always find everything. Right, right. So we do our best to bring the most accurate information to you, but if we're wrong, we're happy to hear the real stories and incidents if you reach out through our website, truecrimeandchill.com. Yes, we will also take those suggestions, and we can also take them through our Facebook page, True Crime and Chill, and our Facebook group, True Crime and Chill, as well. So the group will probably be easier to reach us at, but... All right, that being said, let's get into the ghost town of Jerome, Arizona. Obviously not physically, because, you know... I mean, that would be pretty freaking sweet if we could just, like, teleport there. Like, I I think we need to step up our game, Amber. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I may be the maven of marketing, but I'm not that magic. Ah, oh, dang it. All right. So, Jerome sits on top of Cleopatra Hill between Prescott and Flagstaff, Arizona. And it's nicknamed the Wickedest Town in the West. It was founded in 1876, and its peak population was approximately 15,000 people in the 1920s, which in 1920s, that's a pretty big population, actually. It was a copper mining town that produced approximately 3 million pounds of copper each month. And World War II greatly increased the demand for copper, so they were sitting pretty with that demand. But... After the war, the demand decreased dramatically, so with Jerome's economy completely dependent on the demand for copper, Phelps Dodge Mine closed in 1953. The remaining population of around 50 to 100 people promoted the town as a historic ghost town. In 1967, the federal government officially designated it a National Historic District, the remaining 
and the remaining inhabitants more or less pushed it to be a tourist attraction. So not going to lie, when when you said, like, the wickedest town in the West, I imagine pew, 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 pew. Kind of. In my head. So one of these things I've been seeing with, like, ghost towns and stuff, especially with, like, old mining towns, is, like, they're ghost towns because literally this town ran off one thing, whether it was mining or the fact that, like, the trains came through or, like, all this other stuff and everything. And then once the demand for that, like, dried up, then these ghost towns were kind of like, okay, well, whatever, like, we're just here and stuff. So it's super interesting that, like, with everyone, you're like, I mean, this is a little bit more recent because, like, you know, World War Two and stuff. And, I mean, like, yeah, recent. But it's a little bit more recent with, like, World War Two and stuff because, yeah. But, like, it's just really interesting to kind of, like, see that stuff. And also, fun fact, when I was younger, I used to think ghost towns were actually, like, ghost towns. Like, ghosts live there. Well, and they used to have, well, and they used to have this like show called Kid Nation on TV, like long time ago. I swear to God, it was where they literally sent like a group of like 20 kids out into a ghost town, just had them live there and create their own society. And it was just, it was the weirdest thing. And I remember watching it going, these kids are going to be eaten by ghosts. <laughs> Cause that's what I thought a ghost town was. It wasn't until I got older that I realized it was just an abandoned town. Well, the thing about this ghost town is that there is a particularly supposedly haunted building. In Jerome, the United Verde Hospital was built in 1926, opening in January of 1927. It was built to help serve the miners in the community and to replace the old hospital that was built in 1917. It was shut down in 1950. It then had live-in caretakers with the last living caretaker committing suicide in 1980. Hmm. Manoa nice. Hoff... Okay, I'm going to butcher this name. I'm going to say that right now. It's Manoa Hoffperor. Hmm. He was a local man that was hired by the Phelps Dodge Mining Company to be a presence in the vacant building and hoping also to offset the years of vandalism. Manoa was found hanging from a steam pipe in the engineer's office where he resided while serving as the caretaker. His death was in 1982, and it was ruled as a suicide. During its days as the United Verde Hospital, an estimated 9,000 deaths occurred. However, no known records are present, so that number has yet to be validated. After the death, it was boarded up and watched over by locals and the police. In 1993, Larry Althair lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and he made an offer to the Phelps Dodge Corporation, who currently owned the hospital, as I said, and they accepted his offer, and he took possession of it on May 29th of 1994. It started operating as the Jerome Grand Hotel in 1996. When it was purchased, the hospital records were gone, so any information regarding staff and patients is via word of mouth only with little or no verification. The hospital was a general surgical hospital meeting the needs of all who entered. Unlike the name of the resident restaurant, a separate business from the hotel named the asylum, the building was never an insane asylum, nor was it exclusive for tuberculosis patients. So three things I've gotten out of that whole thing. (laughs) Four things actually. Um, one, nobody ever thought to, like, investigate the death. I mean, I understand that he was the only person out there, but, I mean, hello, that's the perfect way to get away with a murder. I mean, you know, uh, it also has kind of that spooky element, like, oh, maybe it was so haunted he couldn't handle it, so he killed himself? Uh, ma'am, I don't think this is a Stephen King uh, uh, book right here, and if, for those of you who get that reference, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so the second thing is um one i don't trust anything with the name asylum in it period end of story like now if you if you're if it if you have an asylum it's anywhere in your name i don't trust you you're haunted you're probably evil and there's some shady shit to go on behind those curtains like i'm telling you right now it was just a restaurant that named itself that it's not really Mm -hmm. restaurant Mm -hmm. so three i'm looking at pictures of jerome arizona there's a lot of nice houses. Yeah. 
Well, it's and this supposedly abandoned ghost town for like it's a lot of nice houses, and I'm like, one, why would y'all want to live there? But okay, whatever. I ain't judging you. And okay. Did I hear the hospital was owned by the same company that owned the mine? Yep. Okay, that's not shady. Well, the hospital was really built to serve the families who had family members working in the mine. All right, and I'm looking at this hospital right now. Mm Mm-hmm. It's got some weird vibes, and I don't like it. But you know what? I can't say anything because I haven't seen it close up. We haven't heard a lot of everything that's going on. Like, I opened up an article, and the first thing was, that's a lot of sickness, and, like, 9,000 people died in the Jerome Grand Hotel during its life as a hospital. It's a lot of sickness, pain, and deaths, and it's like, dang, you guys are not having a good time right now. Right. Well, so, let's let's go back to Jerome for just a second, and then we'll get into the, the Jerome Grand Hotel. Jerome is, is on a hill. It's actually considered the mm-hmm. steepest city in, I think, the United States. Um, yeah, it definitely. And trust me, I saw some steep hills living in Colorado Springs because yeah. Manitou Springs is literally built, which is like right next to Colorado Springs. Manitou is literally built into the mountain. So I saw some steep hills at Manitou. So considering Jerome is considered like, oh, the steepest city. Uh, yeah. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the original buildings uh, have crumbled away because, you know, the mm-hmm. hillside. So a lot of the buildings that are there now are newer, not all but a lot of them um and you do have to have some people living there who work in the town right because it's essentially a tourist attraction but it still requires people to work there and do things so i imagine there's some people that do still live there i also imagine the cost of living is incredibly low because uh who would really want to live there sorry right it's kind of so you know what it reminds me of though it's kind of like with um oh gosh if anybody's ever seen Silent Hill, there's a place in Virginia, I believe it is, that is based after. And that's what it reminds me of. It's like people yeah. still live there, but like the cost of living is super low because who wants to live in a town with lava burning underneath it? Like, right. So to this day, the Jerome Grand Hotel in Jerome, Arizona, is said to be one of the most haunted buildings in the state. The paranormal activity described in the historic hotel includes lots of strange occurrences, including the sound of ghostly footsteps going up and down stairs of hallways, doors that open and close on their own, objects that unexplainably move of their own will, and electrical appliances that turn on and off by themselves. Oh, fun shit. Right. Like your average paranormal stuff, right? Uh, Many of these strange happenings occur in front of the housekeeping staff who have seemingly become favorite targets, sometimes hearing their names being called out by phantom voices. However, they say that the ghosts are accommodating enough because when they ask them to stop, they do for at least a few days. The hotel lobby is an active place for many of the spirits as the lobby doors have often been seen opening and closing by themselves, like someone is arriving or leaving. Chairs have been rearranged while desk clerks turn their back. Items have flown off the shelves in the gift shop, as well as from the walls in the lobby, and the lobby desk has also received a number of phone calls from empty rooms. It comes as no surprise, apparently, when the line is picked up that no one is on the other end. First off, whoever's working in this hospital has a lot of balls. Like, I just want to say that right now. Um, I love haunted stuff, but only for a minute. Like, like I will definitely spend the night in a um, haunted place, but I'm not going to work there. I mean, you kind of get to where... Especially when this stuff is happening. I mean, with stuff like that, it's like, as long as you're aware of it, it's like, okay, just knock it off. You know, like it, it doesn't seem malicious to me it just seems mischievous and it sounds like if you're like hey dude just knock it off like they stop so it's to me the ones that are scarier when you're like um stop it and then they don't uh you know stop it no um some of the more common spirits that have said to be seen include a woman in white a an old miner with a beard and of course a little boy who appears to be about six years old Okay, one, there's always kids. 
um, haunting hotels. And two, there's always women in white haunting hotels. I want to see a woman in, like, a goth girlfriend get up haunting a hotel with just this bored look on her face. <laughs> Well, with the woman in white, apparently she's she was seen at the beginning and she hasn't been seen for many, many years. Um, it's thought that she, maybe she was a nurse at the hospital. Um, since this is the supernatural episode, I do want to touch on the little kid thing, though, because oftentimes spirits who are appearing as children are not really children. No, they're not. They want to kill you. Right. They are often a demon of some kind pretending to be a child. So, um, and you are allowed your own opinions about that, but this has been, um, tossed back and forth a lot with paranormal experts up to, and including, um, the Warrens who, uh, I was watching an episode they were doing on Annabelle. They were, it was like a TV show they were on in like 2000 and discussing Annabelle and saying how oftentimes if something says it's a child or pretends to be a child, it's not really a child, it's a demon. So. You know, depending on where you sit with Ed, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. That's well, I mean, okay, so I'm kind of torn with Ed and Lorraine Warren. I really am. Because I do believe that Lorraine... Because, like, I'm not the one to be like, oh, well, like, that kind of stuff doesn't exist. It definitely does exist. There are things out there that you cannot explain. There are things out there that you can't... Whatever. But there are a lot of people who are on the fence with them because they don't believe... Because they really believe that, like, yeah, it started out okay, but then they really believe that, like, they started just making up stories to, like, gain their popularity. And I feel like that kind of does happen with certain paranormal investigators. It's like, yeah, it starts out, like, real, but then it's just kind of shock value. You know what I mean? And I I mean, mm. I I also struggle with their, their stories and stuff, too. Um, some of them, I'm like, you know, I... I'm not against outlandish claims. I've had things happen in my presence. I have seen things I cannot yeah. explain. Okay. But um, I also believe that they, can, you know, they had a lot of interesting solutions and, and um, experiences that I believe are real. But then I also think that there are some of them that are p perhaps fabricated to increase the popularity of said story or said incident or of themselves. But yeah to each their own um during the hospital days like we said many deaths appear occurred from illness or injury but also some rather suspicious in origin uh like that of the maintenance guy claude harvey claude was found pinned by the back of the neck by the elevator quite dead although inspection of the elevator was done it was uh a thorough inspection of the elevator was done, as well as a coroner's inquest that determined the elevator could not have caused Claude's death. No autopsy was allowed to be performed, an x-ray was not allowed to be taken, and the United Verde Copper Company, who owned the building, did not want suspicion pointing in their direction as uh, accident nor intent. Claude's is the only death in the hospital whose cause has yet to be determined. Speculation is that Mr. Harvey was murdered and his body was placed in the elevator room with his head hanging over the elevator shaft to look like an accident. I think everybody who has ever I just, I I think anybody who's ever listened to us knows how I feel about this kind of stuff. Shady. Shady. Okay. Super shady. Very shady. Y'all are covering something up. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's possible. You're dead. An inspection's done. Like, it says, oh, the elevator couldn't have killed him. So how the hell was he killed? Nobody's allowed to do anything except just be like, oh, okay, because this company just says no man don't be suspicious don't be suspicious. don't be suspicious don't be suspicious don't be suspicious yeah no thank you <laughs> um there are also several stories about death that are associated specifically with room 32 at the jerome grand hotel incidents include a man rolling his wheelchair off the room's balcony and another man taking his life in the room though 
this is one of those instances where I couldn't find any real reports of these rumors. However, if you happen to live in Arizona and have more information, we'd love to hear the real stories. Please, please feel free to reach out to us through our website, truecrimeandchill.com. It has been reported, however, that if you stay in room 32, you'll see things like doors opening and closing on their own, faucets turning on by themselves, and you'll hear scary noises. Tell you, haunted, haunted. Because I'm telling you, just tear the whole thing down. Just at this point, tear the whole thing down. Well, they like, I, it, we're getting to it, but it sounds like they like being kind of the hotbed of paranormal activity. I mean, yeah, go ahead. You, you, you do you, boo. Like, I don't give a shit, but bruh. Uh, Phoenix's 12 News visited the hotel in late 2020, so not that long ago. And they went on to see if they could capture anything in room 32. They posted a video on YouTube that I will have on our page, truecrimeandchill.com. And their most compelling evidence came from a Ouija board, including the board saying there were spirits in the room and spelling out names. Kids, don't play with Ouija no. boards, okay? No, I'm telling you right now, this is from somebody who would gladly go and explore a haunted house just because. Don't can play with Ouija boards, okay? I want you to go home if you've if you if you ever play with the Ouija board and watch the movie Ouija. Because let me tell you, that's going to tell you what's going to happen to your ass if you play with Ouija boards. That's a start. Uh, there's So, I just want to, first of all, watching them use the Ouija board, it was really obvious that um, I don't think anything that they said or did was really paranormal. They came on and had kind of like a Zoom meeting afterwards and talked about how None of them really felt like weirded out or creeped out. The creepiest things were really like the hallways and the elevator, which of course it's an old like hospital. Those are going to be creepy anyway, right? There's a mm -hmm. place here in Port Angeles that used to be a hospital and now it's an apartment building. And the couple of times I was there, the hallways made me incredibly uneasy, but my friend was smart enough to like sage her apartment. So it didn't feel like as heavy, I guess. Um, so I can understand feeling creeped out in like the elevator eh, and the hallways and the stairways, but the room itself, it doesn't seem like they were very uncomfortable in it. And I really don't think that they were, um, really using the Ouija board seriously, which honestly is okay because, um, Ouija board, it's just asking for trouble. Don't. Yeah, like Ouija board. Like, don't get me wrong. I am like I'm a firm supporter and doing shit with the supernatural. Like, trust me. I'm like, yeah, go. You do you, boo. But don't don't fuck with Ouija boards. Nope. Like, nope. nope. Here's nope. the thing. Nope. Nope. Even the Satanic Temple tells you, and I'm not talking about Church of Satan because Church of Satan is a very terrible thing, and it was it, yeah. Satanic Temple is completely different. If you've never looked into it, actually look into it before you start going, oh my God, she's a Satan worshiper. No, I just had, a, I, I did a report on them. It's very interesting. Anyways, but even the Satanic Temple is like, don't mess with Ouija boards, please. We want you alive and well. Yeah. No, it's just asking for trouble. It's true. It'll open up gateways to all sorts of stuff. So, oh yeah. Anyway, um, but ultimately uh, it just, um, I totally lost my train of thought. So the thing for me is like, I, like I said, we purposely do this first episode of the month as a paranormal episode because we have experiences of paranormal. We have belief in the paranormal and there are places and urban legends that I firmly believe really have things there. Okay. Um, I, the experiences I personally have had, maybe we'll have to talk about them sometime, there's no way for me to explain away what I have seen and what I've experienced. And I've tried. Yeah. I've tried. Can't do it. So, um, you know, if, if somebody's going there trying to see if an experience will happen and then they do something like a Ouija board, um, to me, that's somebody who doesn't understand what they're doing. To me, that's somebody who's asking for trouble rather than investigating it. Yeah. Yeah, I, going for Ouija boards just 
we're we're being completely serious. I'm not being. I'm not joking. I'm not doing anything. Like, don't mess with a Ouija board, please. And if you do, just just move out in the middle of nowhere and don't talk to anybody, please. Yeah, yeah. Sage the place, please, at the very least. Yeah. Um. So that all being said, I do believe just from the stories and stuff that there's possibly something to the rumors about mm-hmm. the hotel because you can't honestly have a hospital where 9,000 people died and not have anything there. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I really, I really firmly, honestly, truly believe that now, whether it's residual energy, whether it's, you know, a demon, like when we talked about the kid, I don't know, but personally i say it's really difficult to have a place where that many people have had experience you know have had death some of them traumatic yeah and have at least no residual energy left behind like that's maybe it's just my opinion but no i get it but the thing to me that's suspect i guess is that the entire town is built around this ghost town mentality and the tourism from it. If you do visit the Durham Hotel, keep your eyes peeled because there are places around the hotel where they have put an actual like statue figure. Uh, and it's the worst kind of double take you'll ever want to experience because there's nothing quite like bumping into something and you're like, oh, my God. oh it's just a statue. And I know many of us had this happen, right? Like it's it's one of the, it's scary, and then you are embarrassed. Dude, I, have, I I do that in my own damn house. Okay, I know. So imagine I doing it in a place where you're expecting to be potentially haunted. Like I live in an I live in an army post, so you know damn well that this place is haunted because it's a army post. Okay. Side note: most of these are built on Indian burial grounds. I mean, just like the United all the U.S., but whatever. Yeah. Um. But, uh, no, like, I do that all the damn time. And, like, if, like, I'm by myself in the house mm-hmm. or, like, Dustin's, like, out in the garage doing something and it's, like, the middle of the night and the boys are sleeping and I'm by myself and everything. And, like, it really freaks me out when, like, the dog are on my bed, especially my especially my lazy one, Max, and he just all of a sudden gets up. Bah, 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 bah. I'm like, what the fuck are you barking at? There's nothing. Yeah. And then it was, like, a flash from a headlight or something. I'm like, can we yeah. stop scaring me? Oh, my God. Well, if you look through the internet, you'll find a handful of videos taken at the Jerome Grand Hotel and photos. And they were taken by ghost hunters and anyone interested in the unusual activity. The hotel happens to welcome those who are seeking to find the paranormal activity. So be sure to share your experiences if you do go. And uh, also be sure to share them with us at our website, truecrimeandchill.com. Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.